how are they doing in these different symbiotic states? Is there any difference or benefit to, to hosting one over the other? And that's just a closer look at that crack, and it's just striking within half a meter. This is the back of the crack. This side, they're 100% brown. This side, they're 100% green. So there's this really distinct demarcation of the difference in these two um, symbiotic states. And it must be that there's enough of a light differential as the sun goes over that it produces enough of a temperature change that it's flipped them to one symbiotic state or the other. That's what I think is going on because I can't think of anything else that will produce this really distinct pattern here. So we just collected a number of these from this side, a number of them from that side, and then got some of the asymbiotic and brought them into the laboratory and decided just to look at a snapshot of, in a sense, fitness of this animal and try to determine if, if we could assign one a better fitness score than the others based on uh, reproduction. And these anemones are really nice. You can stand them on their heads and just snip open the pedal disc and you can pull out a little piece of the gonad and you can look at it. And if you do it carefully, you don't even kill the animal to heal from this, which is really nice. Um, very robust animals. And so you go in here, you get a little bit of the mesentery, you pull it out, you can squash it on a microscope slide. This is a female gonad squashed down. You can see the oocytes there with the nucleus, the nucleolus. This is a male gonad. And so you can <clears throat> get an idea of how reproductive they are. And there's a huge assumption in all this, and that's that they're temporally aligned, which they're probably not. So this is just a first step, because one could just be offset and reproducing sooner than the other. We don't know, but we're assuming they're kind of on the same cycle just for the purposes of this particular set of data. And then we create gonad indices. It's the kind of crude work that we ecologists do in trying to quantify things. Uh, and we did it just based on what the gonads looked like and then how much you had to magnify them to find a gonad, first of all, and then to determine whether it was male or female. And it just gave us a repeatable quantitative way to put an index value on how reproductive these were. And then our question was, if you're green or you're brown, are you, where do you fall on this scale versus asymbiotic? And can we detect any differences in symbiotic state? And here are the data from that particular set. Let me tell you what this is. So we've got axes that represent the density of the muscatinii, and then the density of marina, and then the gonad index on the top. And the first thing to, to recognize from this is that if something's up against this wall of the box, it means it had no muscatinii in it. It was totally green. This wall of the box is totally uh, brown muscatinii. And it was nice because that shows, first of all, there's, there's not any mixing going on. There's nothing occurring out in the middle here. They either were totally brown or totally green, so we have a good distinction of those two, a good separation. The whites, it looks like there's fewer, but it's because most of them are down here without any gonad. So they're, the points overlay one another. And if you just kind of squint at that, it looks to me like the browns have more gonad than the greens, and the greens have more gonad than the whites. And so it fits the prediction we had that if symbiodinium is the better symbiont, which we think it is, it produces more carbon. That carbon flows into reproductive structures. You're producing better gonad, more gonad. You're at a reproductive advantage relative to the greens and the, the whites. So that was kind of the idea we were working on. And at first blush, what these data look like. But that's a gross oversimplification. And there's lots of things that affect reproduction of invertebrates. And one is body size. Uh, you get bigger animals, you tend to have bigger gonads in general. And so body size is important. Another feature is, um, you can see in this particular anemone, this is an angry anemone. And if you put these things against something that's not genetically identical, these are clonal animals, so if you put it against something that's not identical, it inflates these large acaragi, and those become like big maces full of nematocysts they'll lean over and slap each other with, like the sweeper tentacles on corals. And so under these situations, they may invest an awful lot of energy into something other than reproduction. And there's a really wonderful, entertaining paper by David Ayer and um, Rick Grossberg called Behind Anemone Lines. You ever want to read a really <laughs> neat paper? I so wish that was my title. Uh, but it has to do with the division of, of function in these communities and how there are warrior anemones out here that go out and they wander out and they fight one another and the reproductives are back here and they're, they're scouts that go out. It's just amazing how integrated these colonies are. Um, so that, that was an important part of you know, what is going on reproductively, where's the energy going, 
So we ran an analysis and included some of these other factors in trying to determine if, in fact, the gonad index could be attributed to how many of these symbionts it had. So this is just a real simple analysis. We did this as a stepwise regression, looking at just the biomass of the animal as an index of size, the number of those acaragi as an index of how much energy is going into fighting, and then the density of the two symbionts, and then just the total symbiont density. We hand that over to the analysis and say, which of these is the best predictor of gonad index? And it turns out there's two things, and those are the two, and it doesn't include the symbionts. So we can predict how developed the gonads are based on how big the anim animal is, and then just the total number of symbionts, which suggests it doesn't matter whether they're green or brown, which was a surprise. It, it wasn't exactly what we were predicting and hoping we would see. But if you, you take those gonad index values and correct them by the size, of them, um, so weight adjusted, it turned out that the greens were a little bit smaller. Not a lot, but just a little bit smaller. And the net result is these things are almost smack on top of one another. And so it suggests that if you lack symbionts, you're not going to be very reproductive, suggesting both are probably partners that you want. But it doesn't matter who you have, that you can be pretty non-selective in which symbionts in your tissues and you'll do just fine. You'll be equally fit. So that was a little discouraging because we were really hoping to find more than this. So we went a step further. And the step further is that if you want to talk about fitness in a clonal animal, you can't entirely put all the eggs in the reproductive basket. That these have another mode of reproduction. And that's this fission, this cloning that goes on. And this is how they do it under the right conditions. One end goes north, one goes south, or east and west in this case, and just rip themselves in half. And uh, then you have two genetically identical clone mates. And certainly if this is going on, that's, that could be some measure of fitness that maybe we hadn't accounted for. Maybe size was related not to how they're feeding, but if you tend to divide more in one state or the other, that could result in smaller body sizes. There's all kinds of confounding factors here that made it impossible for us to definitively say that the symbionts don't matter. So we decided to try and address that. And the experiment went involved going out to Tatoosh Island off the far, far tip of Washington State. It's owned by the Macaw Indian Nation who are really nice about letting us go out there. It's a beautiful site that's really pretty undisturbed, um, except for the biologists who hang out there. <laughs> and um, on this site, we found uh, other lots of places, but this particular one was a boulder that we sampled. And it just had beautiful demarcation of browns, greens, and, and apos within a single, this is about a meter. So within one meter, we're getting this wonderful assortment of individuals that probably had very similar history, similar conditions. They could actually all be clone mates. We don't know. We haven't looked at that. But the chances of at least some of them being genetically identical are pretty high because they're clonal animals. And so we collected 60 of each morph and took them back to the lab, carried them back to uh, our site. And then we set up this large outdoor tank. The goal of this was to mimic the conditions that these anemones would experience under natural conditions. So we have these tables, and you, you look at that and say, that's not natural, they're on AstroTurf. And that's true, they are on AstroTurf. I'll tell you about that in a second. But um, they're in this large tank. Uh, this tank has a drain hose you can't see here. It's connected to a ball valve that's computerized and connected to offshore tide cycles. So periodically that ball valve would open, which would drop the water down below the level of the tables, exposing them. When the signal came, it would close that valve and it would refill to the other standpipe and we could have the tides go up and down. And that's fairly complicated in our waters. We have mixed semi-diurnal tides, so they're up and down twice a day. And by mimicking the tides about the middle of the tide zone for these, we hope to have something similar to what they might naturally experience. We then wanted to add irradiance on here, and so we put some shields over these individual stands so that we could have conditions that would normally be favorable for the APOs, for the greens and the browns. And then we took individuals from each symbiotic state and put them in each of those conditions to look at the interplay between light and temperature, symbiotic state and gonad, and fitness overall. So that was the model of the experiment. And that's what it actually looked like. And it does look kind of weird. Uh, we had to put them on these plates. These animals are actually incredibly mobile. And so this was an effort to avoid a daily anemone rodeo. And, and it, it, was, it was really important 
track individuals for the period they're in the tank, and they're in there for 11 months. And so trying to keep them in there and know who is who, we had numbers on all these tiles, and this discouraged them. They don't like the feel of the AstroTurf on the pedal disc, and so it was enough to, to keep them pretty much in place. We still had a little roundup to do occasionally, but, but they didn't. You can see <laughs> these guys are <laughs> headed, for the, headed back for the barn. Um, but, but it worked pretty well, and we could keep them in there. The tide's going up and down. We actually fed them because they didn't get the natural food they might get in the field, so we supplemented their diet with a, a weekly feeding. And then just over the next period, made measurements that we would call fitness. And those could be divided out into sexual reproduction, um, gonad growth. We could look at growth of the body, somatic, and then fission rates. And by knowing every individual, we could track those over time. And these are what the conditions look like. Uh, this is just to show that the, the light levels did fall out pretty clearly, much higher in the 85, dropped down to 43, and then the very low light had almost no light at all. And then not a lot of difference in mean or minimum temperature, but some, especially in the summer, some substantial differences in maximum temperatures that these are reaching, three to five degrees, six degrees at difference in what these are seeing. And that would be profound for a coral. For these anemones, who knows? But that was our goal to try and figure out what the consequence of that would be. And then this is the, the pattern of the experiment. Collected them out here in September, put them in the outdoor tank, and then did a whole lot of cleaning and taking care of the tank through these, these months. And then June, August, and September, we sampled subsets of them. And it was unfortunate we had to break up the samples, but we had to capture the reproduction. We didn't know when that would happen. So by dividing that up into thirds, we actually bracketed the, the reproduction. So none of these were reproductive. These were in the early stages, these were transitional. So we did actually capture that, that period of reproduction. We also had to discard some of the data because some of them did switch symbiotic state. And we didn't want any confusion from, well, this was brown, but now it's apo. And that was the largest pattern was in the very high light, a number of the greens and the browns actually went asymbiotic. We drove the symbionts out or bleached them. And so we tossed those data out so we could just focus on only those individuals that maintain their symbiotic state and then took the data to look at fissions, growth, and gonad index. So that's what I'll, I'll show you here, three graphs. So here's the weight and its loss. They did lose weight. They typically do through the winter. It's, it's the pattern for this species. And here's the asymbiotic. Here's the browns, or here's the greens and the browns. And if you look at that overall, the, the pattern is that the zooxanthellate tended to lose more weight than the asymbiotic. And that's kind of an interesting pattern and it didn't make a whole lot of sense because we thought these were, I'm sorry, I take that back. These are, this is weight loss. So more weight loss if you didn't have the symbiont. So if you did have symbionts, you maintained your weight a little better, which is what we expected. And the zooxanthellate tended to be maybe marginally better than the zochlorellate, though it's not significant. Those bars at the top tell us that that treatment and that treatment were different. So weight loss, weight, weight control, uh, if you have symbionts, it appears that maybe you're doing a little better. And if you don't, um, we didn't, we, we saw a little bit of difference in the, the uh, actual irradiance levels, and it's a little confusing what that looks like. Um, so I'll talk about that more in a second. Gonad index, general pattern is that the browns had less gonad development than the other two symbiotic states. And that's the pattern that was sort of opposite what we, we thought would happen. Fissions tend to see a different pattern where we're getting actually a little bit higher level of fission in the, the zooxanthellate, in the browns. And so this, the hint in this was that maybe different symbiotic states are leading to different life history strategies in what these anemones are doing and how they're responding to whatever's going on with the symbionts. Those, I find those univariate plots kind of confusing. So we, we looked at the data a little bit different way. And this was a discriminant analysis. And to do this, we take the data for the number of fissions, the gonad index, and the weight. And we hand it to the computer, and we have it find linear combinations of those that discriminate the treatments. And so it takes the best, best assortment or weighting of those variables that, that breaks those into their individual groups. And then you have it go in and say, can you actually distinguish these groups from one another based on these linear combinations? 
and it was very significant. It, the, the technique was good. It was able to discriminate them. And here are the, the functions that it produces. It probably can't see this, but this axis here is weighted very heavily by weight change. And then equal and opposite contributions of how many fissions they had in the gonad index. This is almost entirely gonad index. So based on those relative weightings, we divided this into quadrats that we qualitatively identified by what was really happening with any anemone that fell into that quadrat. So we have anemones that were low fitness. And by that we mean they lost a lot of weight, they didn't go through any fissions, and they didn't have any gonad. Um, we had high fitness, opposite of all those. They're doing really well. Lots of gonad development, lots of fission, maintaining weight. And then we had these two quadrants where we're actually seeing a separation of life history strategies to a very sexual pattern to a very asexual pattern. And what I'm going to show you is where the treatments fell in these and the combination of symbiotic state and, and uh, the light treatment. And I'm going to show you for each set of anemones by themselves. And these all have the same pattern. So if we start here with the uh, asymbiotic anemones, they have no symbionts. You put them in the dark, they tend to be fairly sexual. There's a lot of reproduction going on. In fact, some of the biggest gonad development was in this group. If you start to increase the light, they're still up in the same quadrat to a point, but if you get them in really high light, suddenly you drop them into really low fitness. And we think that's simply the absence of pigments. These things are used to being in the dark. You suddenly put them in great light and it's very stressful. Um, it probably is the, any stress that they encounter is not compensated by what a symbiont could give you. And so it tends to have a very negative effect. So suggesting that under high light conditions, it's really beneficial to have some symbionts, potentially for shielding and for energetics. So that's what we see in the, the APOs. The pattern in the greens is really different. And the general pattern is, if you have these things in the dark, they tend to be asexual animals. They're not producing gonad. Um, so something's going on with this interplay of the symbiont and the light conditions to cause them to only go through fissions. As you increase the light, they become much more sexual. And, so, and this is probably the primary habitat they live in, sort of this intermediate light level. So that would suggest that these things may be largely sexual animals under normal conditions. Now the browns uh, are a different story again, in that if you have these things in the dark, they don't do well at all. And all the anemones that we had that had come in brown that we put in the dark shrunk a lot. Uh, they didn't go through any fissions and they tended not to develop gonad. And we think what's happening here is if you take these animals and you put them in these very low light conditions, the symbionts are very ineffective at photosynthesis and they probably become carbon parasites in a sense. They're actually drawing carbon away from the host as opposing to taking carbon and giving it to the host. And so in this condition, they probably become a liability. And it's a bad thing to have the symbionts under these low light conditions. You put them into nice intermediate light and they take off. They're fat and happy and reproductive and a lot of very good things going on for the animals under these particular conditions. Um, if you push them even higher into really intense light, they tend to go asexual. And that's, that's a, a strange kind of pattern relative to the green anemones and, and suggests that there's some intriguing things that are happening based on what symbionties have. And it was odd enough, we thought, you know, I wonder if this is true, we better verify this. And so we went back to the data we had collected from this field site. And these anemones are really nice because if they go through a fission event, they rip themselves apart, it leaves this really nice fission scar on the column. And that fission scar lasts for probably about six, six weeks. And so we could take the data and just look at all the animals, look at the, the columns and see what percentage of these probably went through a fission event in the last six weeks. And we lumped all the data from all the seasons just so we could look at the entire year. And what you see, and these are chi-square analyses where we have the number of scars that they had, the number without scars, so of the asymbiotic, we collected 13 individuals. None of those had a fission scar, indicating none of them had gone through fission in the last six weeks from the period that we collected them. And these are expected values based on the chi-square. You look at the zochlorellate, and uh, of 33, only three of those had gone through a fission. 
and that's about what we expected. The expected value would be about six. The zooxanthellate, and if you look at the uh, standardized residuals, that's the cell that really jumps out as the one that's really abnormal. And the result is we would have expected only about eight of those to have gone through fission if you base it on the chi-square, and we had 14 of them that had, which suggests, in fact, if you're brown, you tend to be much more asexual than the greens, which fit very well the, the data that we had collected in the, the lab. So something about the identity of that symbiont appears to be pushing these one direction or the other. And that has some pretty important implications for um, these particular populations and how they're interacting with their environment and with their symbionts and how this whole system functions. And one of the, the things we think is really important is these animals tend to thrive in these high intertidal environments where it's actually a pretty stressful place to be. And the fission may be a very important adaptive response for, for several reasons. First one is that um, when you're up that high, you don't get a lot of benthic food. So you're not down low where a lot of stuff's raining on you as you, the tides go up and down. And so one argument is that uh, fission is really good for these animals because it separates them into uh, smaller subunits that have a greater mouth area per volume. And so you get more tentacles, you get more mouths, you have this big clone of individuals that probably is better at capturing the food and getting the heterotrophic nutrition they need. So having a brown symbiont that can actually exist up there may push you toward a strategy that's this fission strategy that is good for you in that situation. Another thing, and Ileana did some of this work actually, that these things do better um, controlling temperature if you can get clusters of individuals. So a single solitary individual is not going to do very well. They, they dry out quickly and their temperature shoots up. If you get clusters of them, they trap water in all the interstices of the individual bodies and that can evaporatively cool them. They do much better up in those things. They can moderate their temperature better, probably favors the symbionts to exist in that. And so again, this asexual strategy may be really important for these. And then finally, the final thing is simply if you're in the high inner tidal where there's a high risk of, of really bad conditions, you don't want your whole genotype to go extinct when one individual dies. So you go through all these fissions and you've spread it out. So they can move, they can get into cracks, they can get into sub-environments that might be favorable. So one of our arguments is that the symbiosis in this is really important for this animal, not only for the energetics, but also perhaps for the life history strategy it drives them to, to be able to exist in these pretty extreme environments. Um, don't know if that's true. A lot we need to understand still about these, but, but an intriguing possibility. And so if we look at this map just overall, uh, the bottom line is that life history is profoundly impacted, we think, by which symbiotic state it lives in. And it's not in a way we would have predicted. It's not just do they get more energetics from the browns and the greens. It's much more complex than that in the interplay of uh, of what happens, and this may well be driven by energy flow. We don't know. Maybe simply having more energy pushes you towards asexual reproduction and less energy takes you towards sexual. Uh, that seems unlikely. We think that these different symbols